about two stars We we'll talk about code or whatever we'll talk about today It's about two stars, so please hang tight While I check that everything is okay Sound, check, camera, check, lights, check How's my hair? Oh, wait, I don't have any hair Maybe put some pants on and I am good to go So get ready wherever you are Cause this stream is about to start Get ready wherever you are Cause this stream is about to start Hello everyone, let's talk about code today and not write code, or perhaps even write some code. <laughs> and I have a very special guest, uh, and that is Jatin Chaudhry. Did I pronounce it right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we have another special guest today, so I am so happy. This is the best stream ever. Hello, Teo. Hi. So last week, we talked to Teo about analog modeling. And he showed us how he goes through the process of coming up with models for analog gear and then simulating that on Spice, turning that into code and all that good stuff. And he showed us one approach that I think is somewhat different from the approach that Jatin follows in his plugin. So he is here to talk to us about all of uh, his plugins and how he does analog modeling and all of that. So before we dive into the deep end, <laughs> for people who uh, know, of course, everyone who is watching this knows your plugins. They know child tape, they know the clone emulator, and now you have your bring your own or build your own distortion, not bring your own distortion, build your own distortion <laughs> plugin. So everyone knows about the plugins, but they may not know about how you got into music, how you got into programming, how you got into, uh, the department where I think you are right now, right, uh, at, at Stanford. Right, yeah, so, um, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll get there. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, I started playing music because uh, when I was very little, my, my mom wanted me and all my siblings to take piano lessons, and so uh, we did that. And yeah, I, I don't know that I really liked it when I was maybe like nine or 10 years old, but when I was in high school, I started to really enjoy uh, playing music, and I played in, in my school band as well. I was playing saxophone. Um, and then sort of towards the end of high school, I, I got interested in sort of electronic music and mixing and mastering and, and things like that. Uh, and a friend of mine introduced me to DAWs and plugins, and so I started uh, just making my own music uh, through... Uh, I, I was using Ableton Live at the time, uh, and I started doing some mixing and mastering as well. Uh, and then that kind of continued into college, and uh, at some point, uh, I, I was studying engineering in college. And at some point, I was learning to program in C++. And I remember one day, I was like, well, I use all this software to make music. Like, I wonder what language people use it use to like program all this audio software. Uh, and it turned out that a lot of it was C++. So that was kind of a nice surprise. And so... Because you were uh, already I, using C++ in your engineering projects? Yeah, so I, I was taking a class uh, during the second half of my first year in college, uh, learning to code in C++. Uh, and so at the at the end of that year, I, I sort of told myself, okay, this summer my project will be I'm going to make a, a plugin for myself. Uh, and I tried, and my, my brother uh, was a programmer at the time as well, and so he helped me a little bit. Uh, but I didn't really get too far. Uh, <laughs> at the time, I was, I was trying to just use the VST SDK and uh, just that, and it was very difficult. Uh, and then the next summer, I got home from college, and my brother was like, hey, have you heard of this thing called Juice? Uh, <laughs> and sort of showed me how to get set up with that. And so that, that was a big step for me, and actually being able to make a plugin that I could load pretty reliably into, into the DAW. So the problems you were there. having with the VSC SDK was not like be, uh, bundling the plugin. It was, well, I guess the problem was more in the infrastructure and bundling the, pro, uh, the 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 plugin than the DSP. Yeah, exactly. I, I 
I don't know if I was even really thinking about the DSP at the time. Uh, <laughs> I was just trying to get something that Plug plus the plugin. Yeah, something that I could build and not get errors, and then I could load into the DAW and open up a UI and just like the very basic stuff that that was not happening for me at the time. Uh, <laughs> but what was so, the yeah. plugin? What were you trying to build? Oh, oh, at the time, uh, I I wanted to build a compressor. Uh, and I, I never finished ma my, like actually making a compressor, but I made like a very crappy distortion uh, <laughs> through, through my attempts at, at making a compressor. I, I ended up with this not very good sounding distortion, but it was kind of a fun effect, even though it, it didn't really do what I wanted it to do. Um, <laughs> and yeah, from, from there, I kind of went through a bunch of, uh, uh, I don't know, various experiments where I was trying to do some distortion things and some delay uh, delay based effects and things like that. Um, and yeah, that, that just kind of continued uh, as sort of a, an experimental thing that I would do in, in my free time. Uh, and then sort of what happened was uh, I, I was convinced that I was going to do a PhD in astrophysics. And so during my last year of college, I was applying to all these astrophysics programs. Uh, and I, I had heard of the, the Karma program at Stanford just because I had read papers and things like that that had come out of there. And uh, obviously, Julius Smith's textbooks are very widely, widely known. Um, and, and yeah, at that time, I had taken a few signal processing classes and things like that. So I was like, well, since I'm applying to graduate school, I'll throw my name into to the Karma program and see what happens. Uh, <laughs> and then it, it turned out that I was rejected for most of the astrophysics programs that I applied to, and I got accepted at, at Karma. So I was like, oh. Maybe I'm thinking about this wrong. Maybe I should be doing more like music technology stuff. Uh, and so I, I ended up going to Karma uh, and, and studying there for two years. And so I actually graduated from Karma in spring of 2020, it must have been, like right right around when the COVID shutdowns were, were starting. Uh, and then Hang I. Hang on, I are you telling me that you got your PhD in two years? <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, I was just doing the master's program there. Yeah, I was, oh, okay. I was not doing a PhD. Uh, <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> yeah, I, I wish. <laughs> I mean, a PhD in two years would be very impressive. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think. Uh, I, I don't think I've got that kind of uh, ability or, or time warping skill. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I was I was there for two years, and then uh, I, I worked for about a year, and then maybe uh, nine months ago or so, uh, I, it was kind of at a point where my my partner was actually moving to the UK to study uh, for her master's degree, and so I figured, well, I'll go with her and I'll, I'll do some freelance uh, uh, audio development, basically, and so that's what I've been doing for the last uh, little while, and yeah, now I'm in in the UK. I'm actually in Oxford right now, uh, and then we're planning to move back to the US maybe in uh, a month or two. I see. And uh, do you want to talk about your other projects? So this this other pl projects you're talking about, or do you want to just focus on the open source stuff? Uh, yeah, I can talk about about a few things. Um, well, actually, I don't know what I'm allowed to talk about. That's yeah, why I, I asked <laughs> that way. <laughs> I, I know I'm allowed to talk about some things, but I always forget what I am and what I'm not. So. Maybe I just shouldn't talk about it. Just <laughs> Fair. Some people want to promote what they're working on, and some people are not really allowed to talk about what they're working on. So I better just ask. All right. So uh, you got into a master's program and was... I, I know that child tape was part of a class project. Was it part of this master's program? Yeah, exactly. So... Um... The, at Stanford, they do like quarters. So uh, there was when I got there, it was the fall quarter, and then the winter quarter of that year, I was taking a, a class with Julius Smith about physical modeling, uh, and I, I had this tape machine that my my neighbor had given to me. Uh, my, I'm from Colorado originally, and and my neighbor in Colorado, uh, she and her husband had been a part of the the Denver Symphony for a long, long time, uh, and in the '60s, her husband would actually be the like the lead oboe player. And so people who wanted to be part of the symphony would send tapes to their house and the husband would listen to them and decide uh, if they should be an oboe player in the in the symphony or not. And so he had a couple of these reel-to-reel -reel tape machines. Uh, and uh, so uh, Irene, the, 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 the lady who lives, uh, who lives there now and who's our neighbor, uh, she was cleaning out her basement and stuff and I was helping a little bit. And she was like, I've got all these tape machines do you want one of them? 
Uh, and I was like, sure, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, and so I had this tape machine and I, I used it for like some recording projects and stuff. And it was pretty fun, um, but it broke down a lot. And it was kind of annoying. For so me it goes. I was like, well, yeah, I was like, well, every time I want to use it, I have to fix it. I'm kind of tired of that. So I figured, well, I'm, I'm taking this physical modeling class. I've studied some like uh, electromagnet, electromagnetic physics and things like that. So maybe between the two of these things, I can come up with a model of this tape machine and then I, I can have my tape machine, but in my in, in my DAW, uh, and then I don't need to, you know, fix it every time I want to use it, or or for recording sessions that are not like at my house, then uh, I can actually use that sound and, and stuff like that. Um, and, and so that was sort of where the idea came from, and then it's sort of. Uh, I, I had expected that I would like Google for or Google search for like papers about analog tape modeling, and I would find a few things, and I could start from there. Uh, but I didn't really find much uh, about like the actual like physical modeling part of uh, uh, of tape saturation or things like that. Um, and so I ended up having to do a lot of that legwork like, myself, which I wasn't expecting to do, but it ended up being pretty fun. So I'm glad I did. And then you ended up writing that that, that thing for the next person. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I was like, well, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, I find it interesting because the when I talk to most people who do a lot of research, they often think about like, oh, what's the research problem I want to work on next? And I don't know if I've ever felt that or I, I don't know if I've ever like asked myself that. For me, it's always like, well, what's the thing I want to make? And then if I'm making something and I realize, oh, there's not much written about this, then it's like, okay, when I finish making it, then I'll I'll try to write about it. Yeah, I think it is uh, part part of this is being interested in things that other people are interested in. So you don't have to worry about gathering interest because people are already interested in what you're doing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, well, I, I never know if people are interested, but I figure, you know, I just make things that I would want to use myself and that I, I do use myself and I'm sure enough other people are, are doing mixing and things like that that need similar tools. So, yeah. And do you think that you're going to get into a PhD in astrophysics? <laughs> you know, maybe someday. Uh, nothing's nothing's impossible. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's very interesting because there's, uh, at least in, in sort of the modern astrophysics, uh, sort of observational astrophysics, the way that they're building telescopes and things like that, there's lots of signal processing and, and skills like that that are needed uh, for that for that work. So uh, it's not it's not completely different than the stuff that I'm working on. Uh, but I, I enjoy what I'm doing now, so I don't know that I'll, I'll apply for a PhD or anything. So <laughs> may, maybe someday, but <laughs> who knows? <laughs> what is life like in academia for people doing music technology and related fields? Yeah, I mean. It's hard for me to answer a little bit because uh, I've only done like a master's program. I haven't done a PhD uh, and, and I can really only speak about what things were like at Karma. Uh, I don't really know as much in, in, in other other schools and other programs. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's a very interesting field because uh, something that I've found from a lot of people that I talk to is that you're always trying to either justify to an arts program why you should be spending so much time like programming or you're trying to justify to an engineering program why you're spending so much time listening to music uh, <laughs> and so I think I think it's always a little bit it's always a little bit where your program doesn't fit into one part of a school exactly uh, and so yeah you have to kind of uh, uh, find a, a place for yourself where you have an advisor or a professor or, or hopefully a group of these people that are doing similar things and, and you can kind of work with them uh, to, to get to where you want to go with your, your research goals and things like that. Um, but it, it's been really nice, at least over the last maybe four plus years, uh, I, I think there have been more and more kind of conferences and, and places for, for people doing music technology to, to publish and to meet and to talk about the stuff that they're doing. Um, which is really exciting. I think it's great. Yeah. All right. So you said that you you fixed some hardware. Did you ever design hardware, or are you mostly interested <laughs> in modeling things so that you can bring them in your laptop? Yeah, I I, I have built a few little things uh, over the years. I, I built a little optical compressor, uh, a 
very very little like maybe like that big uh uh must have been seven or eight years ago now with a friend of mine uh we built a little synth as well that was uh, it had like eight keys so we had to tune it to something weird i don't know my friend was into all these weird tunings and stuff like that um i built a little like uh sort of diode clipper pedal for myself a while ago uh and then i built a, a little digital version of the clon centaur thing that was like running the basically the the same as the plugin algorithm just on a arduino um and so that, that was really fun but i i need to i still have the all of the the wiring and the breadboard and all of that for the the centaur pedal i just need to build an enclosure for it uh <laughs> but yeah i need to uh, i've been moving around a bunch and i haven't really had like a, a fixed workbench for a while so yeah i need to like well, once I once I move back to the U.S., I'm hoping to be sort of settled for a while, and so I would like to build a little like workbench where I can I can build some hardware as well. Uh, I don't think I'll ever build mass-produced hardware, but just stuff that I can use for myself. I, I really enjoy. Yeah. This uh, this Arduino thing is the DSP happening in the Arduino, or is it just controlling something else? Yeah, so for that for that project, the DSP was actually happening on the Arduino. So it's a it's a Teensy uh, board. I think it was like a Teensy three point six or something. Um, and they have like an audio. Uh, they call it an audio shield that you can attach to the the main board, um, and you can get pretty pretty good quality inputs and outputs from the audio shield, uh, and then do all your processing on the on the Teensy. Um, and yeah, it was, I, I was very surprised at how powerful it was. Like, uh, the part of the algorithm was running like a neural network and it was, uh, it was well within like the limits of, of, uh, <laughs> sort of what, what the, the TNC's computational, uh, abilities were, were at. So yeah, that was, that was really cool to see. I was very impressed with that. Yeah. I thought of a similar project, but I was probably going to go, or I am going to go with a Raspberry Pi because I think it has more power than a Teensy or an Arduino, right? Yeah, yeah, the Raspberry Pi definitely has, I mean, I guess it depends on what type of Raspberry Pi you get, because I know there's some really cheap ones as well, but like the basic Raspberry Pi is definitely a bit more powerful than the Arduino. Um, the other thing that I've been meaning to try out that I haven't tried out yet is the Daisy, uh, the Daisy board. Um, the, those seem really cool. I've seen some demos that, that were amazing. I think my problem with the Daisy is that it's maybe a little more expensive than I would like it to be. I think the Teensy plus the Audio Shield is a little cheaper. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> how these things go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So, speaking of expensive things, um, you have worked on open source projects that modeled expensive hardware. So, I guess what you did in that case was to have a prototype. You, you you didn't buy you didn't buy the clone center, right? You you said that in a no. talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I would not. I, I was not able to afford it. I'm still not able to afford it. I'll probably <laughs> never be able to afford it. I can I can dream. <laughs> yeah, but uh, my question is: there is a lot of time that you put into these projects, these open source projects. So, how do you keep everything sustainable? How do you? Uh, uh, effectively have the the time and the resources to to do this open source work. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the the short answer is that it's not sustainable. Uh, <laughs> I guess I guess the long answer is uh, I, I do it because I enjoy it, and because when I have free time, I, I can't really think of something else I would rather do with with that free time. Uh, so <laughs> e even when I was when I was working on. Uh, like uh, I, I was working for Tesla for a little bit and I, I would just get home and write plug-in code because that was what I, I wanted to do. Um, <laughs> uh, I know sometimes maybe my girlfriend wishes that uh, I would take more breaks or, or something like that, but uh, I don't know, I just I just really like it and, and I really enjoy working on products like this. So, I mean, uh, that's kind of the only reason. And then, um, yeah, I guess, uh, I don't know. Some someone asked me uh, a little while ago, if like, oh, now that you're doing like freelance audio development, do you see you see your open source projects as like sort of an advertisement for yourself of like what you're able to do? And I hadn't thought of that, but I guess that kind of makes sense. So yeah. <laughs> that's something too, I guess. I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I guess, uh, Tail, you can too, right? Yeah, sure. I've had uh, business meetings where I was supposed to say something smart about uh, a project, but I usually just say, oh, that seems like fun. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's the most important part to me, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Of course, yeah. in the end of the day, you also have to eat. So I guess there has to be some sort of income. But... Yeah, yeah. And another thing that I wanted to ask you about is you have your finger in many pies and you're also part of the Surge team, or at least you collaborate with the Surge team, right? Yeah, yeah. I've been working with the Surge team for, must be like over a year now. Um, yeah, they, they reached out to me at some point because they had looked at Uh, one of the papers that I'd worked on and we're trying to implement uh, some nonlinear filters based on the paper in Surge. Um, and yeah, it just kind of continued from there because they're just a great community. Uh, the developers there are fantastic. The people who work on testing and on UI design and documentation, like it's, it's just a really wonderful community. Um, yeah, I, I definitely recommend checking them out, even if you're not a developer, if you're just uh, somebody who makes music or if you you know, are interested in contributing in any way, or if you just, you know, enjoy synthesizers. Uh, yeah, it's a really, a really cool project. And actually a, another sort of uh, community that I, I've been a part of recently is the, the Clap plugin uh, development community. That, that's been something I've been working on a little bit for the last uh, maybe two or three weeks that I've, I've really, really enjoyed. And yeah, again, there's some fantastic people who are, who are working on that as well. Yeah, including many people on the Surge team, right? Because Surge is one of the first plugins to have Clap support. Exactly, yeah. So when sort of the, the latest round of development on, on Clap had, had started up, uh, Paul, who's, I guess you'd call him the lead developer on Surge, uh, had reached out to uh, the folks working on, on Clap and was really interested in it. And uh, I, I tend to be sort of skeptical of these things uh, because... I don't know, I've seen different plugin formats and things come and go a little bit and, and different ideas that everyone's like, oh, this is going to be great. And then maybe a year later, everyone's kind of forgotten about it. But uh, Paul, Paul was, was really enthusiastic about Clap. And uh, it's, it's really interesting, too, because he has such a deep experience of working in software development, uh, not just in the audio world, but in, in, in other fields as well, um, and has such great communication skills and things like that. And so it's kind of just Paul's enthusiasm for for the project that made me excited about it and yeah it's been it's been really fun so what exactly are you working on in this well with the surge team and also on this clap endeavor yeah so with surge over the years it's been uh, a few different things i was helping out with some filters uh, helped out with some like cpu optimizations uh yeah just like a few various dsp tasks here and there Uh, and then more recently, we had started working on kind of extracting parts of the Surge synthesizer into their own libraries where they can be tested and, and, and stuff like that um, in, in kind of their own way. And part of, there, there's kind of a twofold reasoning for that. One is that the Surge team is starting to work on some other projects as well. Like there's a, a sampling plugin called Short Circuit, which is really cool. And so they were like, well, We'd like to be able to use some of the same filters and some of the same wave shapers that we're using in Surge. Uh, and plus, it's just nice for folks who are coming from the outside and, and are wanting to learn from the Surge code base. It, it can be a little bit difficult when it's just this massive, you know, thousands of lines of code that has UI stuff and DSP stuff and preset management and so on. Uh, and so just having some separate libraries, it's like, okay, if you just want to see the filters, here they are. If you just want to see some of the backend infrastructure, Here it is. So I, I've been working on that a little bit. Um, and yeah, we, we have some ideas to continue on that uh, and, and to, to do some, some interesting things from there. But yeah, I haven't had time to get back to it in a little bit. Uh, and then for Clap, uh, mainly what I've been working on is sort of writing an interface between uh, a plugin project that's been made in Juice and a, a Clap plugin. Um, so at the moment, Juice doesn't have Clap support the way that it has support for building a VST3 plugin or building an audio unit plugin. Um, and it's, I'm hoping that, that Juice will add that support sometime soon, because, uh, I mean, that, that, would, that would be the best way to, to have Clap support in Juice. But in the meantime, uh, me and, and the, the Surge folks and a bunch of other people who are building Juice plugins also want to have Clap uh, builds available. 
And so Paul had started this sort of wrapper where it basically takes your Juice audio processor and wraps it as a clap, uh, which can be loaded into Bitwig or Multitrack Studio, or uh, I think there's a couple other things that are working on developing clap support um, from the, the host perspective. Um, and yeah, it's, it's kind of neat. I, I can actually show a, a thing here. Hopefully it'll work. Uh, <laughs> if, uh, if anyone's curious about this kind of thing, where's my mouse? Yeah. So um, I, I haven't demoed this before, so I don't know <laughs> for sure if it'll work. Uh, but let's uh, cross our fingers and, and hope, it, hope it works here. So um, yeah, so this is the latest build of Chow Tape, which uh, is not... It's not like an official release yet. There's still a few bugs and things that I need to work out. Um, but if you look here, you can see that this is the clap build. Um, and so one of the really neat things about clap is that you can do non-destructive parameter automation. So, or sorry, not uh, automation, parameter modulation. So in Bitwig, we have these kind of modulators. Uh, and so if we want to, let's say, attach an LFO to our dry wet knob, uh, then we can modulate this parameter uh, in a non-destructive way. So we can still control like the, the base value of the parameter and then just have this modulation added on top of that. Um, so yeah, that's something I was working on uh, last week and this week, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, you can sort of do this in Reaper as well. I say this because most people watching us are probably coming here from the Reaper community because that's where I spend most of my time. And you can sort of do this as well, but it's not at the plugging level. It is mm -hmm. Reaper that has this concept of the center value and the range of modulation. So it's nice that this is now part of one standard. Well, the great thing about standards yeah. is that we have so many of them, but <laughs> still. Uh, so I guess from a developer's perspective, you can always just take your Juice plugin and wrap it in Clap, but you would not be taking advantage of the feature you showed and other nice properties of Clap. So can you talk to us uh, on a high level, <laughs> things that you think that Clap is uh, either fixing or implementing in a particularly elegant way from a uh, plugin developer's perspective? Yeah, I mean, the first and the probably the biggest thing is just from a licensing perspective. You don't have to deal with Steinberg's, uh, let's say, governance of the, the VST3 platform, uh, which I, I know for a lot of developers has been very frustrating over the years. So uh, just having a, a standard and, and open license for CLAP is fantastic. Um, probably the next biggest thing I would say is just having really well-defined communication between the plugin and the host. Um, and, and in particular, I would say this has to do with extensibility. Uh, I think something that a lot of us are used to from working with existing plugin frameworks is you say, okay, well, the VST3 uh, SDK is adding support for this feature. Let's say it's uh, latency reporting or uh, like preset management or, or something like that. I don't know if VST3 has that kind of thing, but uh, Every time there's like a new feature or a new thing that these plugin formats support, uh, there's another sort of extra bit of legwork that the developers have to do to interface with, with that to try to implement it correctly, both from the plugin side and from the host side. Uh, and so, sort of the nice one of the nice things about Clap is that every feature or every sort of concept that the SDK talks about is thought of as an extension. So the base SDK is literally just activate your plugin and process audio. And everything beyond that is an extension. So when I'm implementing my plugin, I have to ask the host, does this host support parameters? And then if it does, I can do all of my parameter operations. And similar from the host side, I have to ask my plugin, does this plugin support parameters? And if it does, then I can go through and, and call all the parameter related code. Uh, and so the nice thing about that is that you have very well-defined boundaries for what has to be implemented and what doesn't have to be implemented. And if you don't want to implement something, you just tell the other side of the communication, hey, I'm not going to implement this. And then it can be handled pretty smoothly. Uh, yeah, this is not the first time I hear about this. In fact, I have watched a talk that if people are interested in CLAP, then they should probably watch this talk or I guess a conversation too. 
uh, at the audio programmer channel, uh, Bacon Paul of yeah. <laughs> uh, of the search project was talking about Clap, along with a uh, developer of Bit uh, uh, of the DAW that we are looking at Bitwig. So, um, mm -hmm. what I don't get is, isn't this true already of all the other standards? I mean, think of like. In Juice, you can say whether you want to have a user interface or just go with the default UI with the sliders. And you can uh, ask what kinds of buses and channels you have. And you can ask about um, the latency. All of these things are just functions that you, or member functions that you implement. And then you, are, you sort of have this concept already of asking whether something is supported or not. Or not. So I, I appreciate the fact that all the extensions live on the same queue and you can just process events on the queue. I get that part. It's a bit more elegant than just having to introduce more and more interfaces. Mm -hmm. But I don't really get the, the, the gist of how CLAP is treating this any different from other standards. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a little bit hard to describe without kind of looking at the, the code directly. Um, but it's... Yeah, I guess I guess the maybe the simplest way to, to think about it is that it allows the the way that CLAP handles extensions allows the base SDK to remain very small and, and not get bloated uh, in, in a way that for example, if you look at the VST uh, SDK and sort of the base, like the base class for all VST plugins and how large it is and how many things need to be implemented for, for that to work correctly, uh, it, it's gotten quite large over the years. And, and to some extent, that makes sense because when people started developing the VST SDK, that was how most things were handled for, for that, type of, uh, that type of code. Makes sense. <laughs> All right, so I just want to shout out to some people who are here on the chat. Hello, Bo. Hello, Fajis. And uh, Mr. Jav. Hello. Um, I think there may be some questions in here, but I didn't really have the time to collect them from the chat. So I guess I'll just continue with my own questions. <laughs> uh, and, and let's dive into analog modeling because it's the main sure, topic yeah. of today. So I am going to ask you a question that I asked Tail as well because I want to see different perspectives from different developers. Uh, you are interested in, let's say, the clone center. Sure. Uh, yeah. And then you find a schematic online. Uh, and then you look at that circuit, how do you break it apart and how do you make sense of like this part, I'm going to use this technique. I'm going to use wave digital filters for this. I'm going to use this neural network for that. Is it like, I know that there are some limitations. There are some components in the circuit that just don't lend themselves very well to wave digital filters. And but in some cases, you do have multiple options. And how do you go about this? Do you first, how do you even break apart the components? And then how do you find what techniques to use for each part of the the model? Yeah, yeah. So actually, let's do this. Since we're talking about the Centaur, uh, let me pull up the uh, Electro Smash article. Uh, so yeah, if you're if you're into this kind of thing, uh, and, and you're not familiar with Electro Smash, you should definitely check out Electro Smash. They have fantastic, uh, I guess, blog posts talking about uh, various circuits and uh, mostly guitar pedals and, and guitar-based uh, circuits. But yeah, they, they do a really nice sort of uh, analog domain analysis of, of looking at these circuits. So this is their analysis of the Klon Centaur, which was, I guess, sort of where I started from when I was, I was looking at this. Uh, and so they do a really nice job here of kind of breaking down. Um, oh, I'm uh, making the text bigger, but I'm not making the picture bigger. Yeah, let's make the picture <laughs> bigger. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they do a really nice job of kind of breaking down this, uh, this circuit. Um, and so when, I, when I'm looking at this with the intention of doing some kind of analog modeling, uh, I usually don't think too much about the power supply and just assume that's, you know, a perfect power supply with exactly the voltage that 
you would expect to get from it. Um, bypass, I don't think about bypass too much either, because again, you know, we have ways of doing that in code that are very, very simple and very easy. Um, so, so then there's kind of just what's left here, the input stage, the gain stage, this summing op amp, and then your tone control and your output stage. Um, and so... For the bypass, do you ever do anything that is not true bypass in a plugin? Uh, I feel like I did once, but I, I don't remember what it, what I did, and I don't remember why. Because uh, <laughs> yeah, to me, it, it feels like the purpose of buffering on a guitar pedal is mostly for dealing with tone sucking, long cables, blah, blah, blah. And that is just a non-issue in software. So I never thought about even considering anything that isn't true bypass on a plugin. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure someone's done it somewhere. But yeah, again, why? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there could be uh, pedals that change the gain even when you bypass them. That's true. It's not yeah. good, but there are pedals that do that. So that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, I guess if you really want, you know, a faithful emulation, then then if the if the bypass mode affects uh affects the signal then you should have that 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 effect in there as well yeah that makes sense um yeah okay okay hang on i want to pause and ask a sidetrack question a meta question when you're Great. modeling something <laughs> do you go for accuracy 100 percent if the original design seems flawed for whatever reason like on bypass it increases the gain which is a nonsensical thing to do in a, a, a plugin do you go for accuracy or do you go for uh, i guess ergonomics usability do you fix the original design in any way <laughs> yeah generally my intention is to go for whatever makes the most sense to me as someone who wants to use a plugin. Uh, I don't, as much as I love analog gear, I, I don't feel like, a, I don't know what the right word for it is. I, I don't feel like I'm cheating if I make some adjustments to what's going on uh, that may not be 100% accurate to the original circuit. Like, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is I would rather have a digital effect that I really like as far as how I'm able to use it and the sounds I'm able to get from it, rather than something that is exactly the same as the hardware. Uh, but again, that's just my preference and my approach. Um, and, and I guess if I'm doing something that I intend to publish, then maybe there's more of a focus on being accurate uh, to the 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 what the hardware does. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I if I were writing a paper about a guitar pedal, I don't think I would write about what happens in the bypass mode unless it was really interesting for some reason. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's just kind of my philosophy. And I, I understand that uh, a lot of people have their own kind of take on that side of things. Yeah, I know for one thing, you didn't try to have a user interface that looks like the pedal. <laughs> you just went with something that makes sense, but it's not well, exactly a one-to-one -one reproduction of the pedal. Some of that is that I don't have the UI design and programming ability to to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the 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 design of most of my plugins. So everything that was good about the design of my plugins uh, has come up from a fellow named Margus who who helped design Chow Tape and especially Chow Matrix a little bit. Um, and everything that's uh, maybe limiting about it or or not so good is is my my lack of design skills. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. So coming back to making sense oh, yeah. of this big diagram in front of us. Yeah. So I guess sort of where I start with this is kind of what I had learned from from some circuit theory classes that I took. Uh, oh, it must have been six or seven years ago now. Uh, but basically, kind of what you you end up with is that. Whenever you have an op amp, uh, you can kind of see the op amp as like a voltage buffer, uh, where if it's operating kind of in the ideal case, then the voltage on each side of the op amp should always be the same. And that's kind of what you're seeing with this uh, op amp configuration here. Uh, and so, like, I, I guess the, the way that I usually think about this is like, okay, you can split on your op amp, uh, and, and, like split split the circuit on your op amp, and, and that's not entirely true. 
Um, there, there's often loading effects and things like that that come into play. Um, but, but it's usually sort of a good enough place to start. And then if you notice that things aren't behaving the way you expect them to, uh, then you can kind of go back and say, okay, well, maybe this isn't uh, the, the right way to think about things. But, but again, I think it's interesting to think about what you expect to happen as the user of a digital effect versus maybe what actually happens in the, the device itself. So for example, like if you think about this, this level knob here and you think about the tone control block here, the value of this level resistor might have some loading effect on what happens in the tone control circuit. But if you're if you're using a plugin, typically you wouldn't want your level adjustment to also change the tone. You would want the tone knob to change the tone and the level knob to change the level, and you would want some separability between those kinds of things. Uh, so I, I think that's kind of another thing to think about is that- Because on a plugin, you cannot go like this to compensate, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, par partly. But I think it's also just sort of what what you would expect, um, uh, at least in, in terms of having control o over these things. Is uh, at least for me, I, I like having controls that are very separable from each other. Um, but but again, that's uh, a matter of taste as as well. Um, but so the the way that I ended up splitting this up was basically the input stage is its own thing, the output stage is its own thing. The tone control circuit is its own thing. And then the gain stage plus the summing thing is its own thing. Uh, and the reason for kind of grouping these is that it's kind of hard to extract. Uh, first, first of all, there's, there's sort of three different signal paths through this main gain stage. And then they all get summed together in the op amp. And it's kind of hard to extract what they're doing uh, from each other without uh, introducing some kind of weird uh, behavior and things like that. So, so that was sort of the main way that I ended up splitting this up. Uh, but, but I think it's it's kind of a hard thing to talk about generally. Like, I, I don't know if there's really hard and fast rules for like where do you split up your circuit uh, to to get different parts. Um, yeah, I think it, it can be a bit tricky. And, and a lot of times there may not be one right answer. Uh, there, there might be three or four that are uh, all valid. And then of course, maybe sometimes you don't want to split it up at all. Maybe you just want to look at this as one giant thing and try to think about it all in one, uh, all, all in one process. Right, okay. So uh, can you choose one of these boxes, perhaps the simplest one, and walk us <laughs> through the process of deciding what techniques to use to model that. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> if I really want to go simple, I'll probably take the input stage, but that maybe seems too boring. Uh, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with that, because you mentioned something interesting about the, the, the operation of the op amp. When we were looking at an RC filter last week with Tail, we saw that if you put two RC filters in a row, they interact. One capacitor is charging and discharging the other capacitor. So you don't get simply one RC filter and the outputs of that going to the next one. When you write sure. the code that does exactly that, just cascading two filters, you end up with a different result. But it seems like the op amp could be one place where you could slice things and isolate them, which I guess is going to help with performance. It's going to help with reasoning about the circuit, solving equations as necessary, and so on, right? Yeah, having op-amp buffers. Uh, I, wish, I wish every circuit designer explicitly put an op-amp buffer between every important stage of their circuit. That would make our life as, as uh, analog modelers much easier. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, that, that doesn't happen too often since, I, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why, but I, I mean, one, one main one is that uh, a lot of times you don't want to have too many op amps in your circuit because uh, they, they draw power and they can be expensive and they take up a lot of space on the, the circuit board relative to some other components. Uh, 
but in this particular circuit, having this buffer is kind of important because you've got this DC bias that's being added here, the plus four and a half volts. Uh, and so having that buffer kind of stops the bias. It, it, it helps keep the bias constant regardless of what kind of signal uh, the rest of the circuit is, is looking at. Um, so that's that's kind of nice. But yeah, so if we were to just look at this input stage by itself, uh, so this input we usually think of just as a voltage source in, in circuit modeling. Um, and then you've got resistor and capacitor in series, and then another resistor going to this bias voltage. And then you've got your op amp buffer. So I would probably just think of this as like a one pole filter because you've just got one capacitor and then you add some, add some bias signal to it uh, after the fact. Uh, and I think that's what I ended up doing in the, in the Centaur model is just deriving the, the one pole filter uh, equation for this circuit using like the Laplace transform or something like that. Um, and yeah, that was, I, th I think for this circuit, it wasn't too complicated. So uh, even for something yeah. as simple as a one pole filter, you would derive the equations from scratch instead. What we did last week was we started with an RC filter and we saw, okay, there is an off the shelf algorithm well known you can just go look it up and implement the RC filter and you have control over the parameters, the time constants and everything. So we just went with that. And of course we learned that it doesn't compose all that well, but as long as you're able to isolate pieces, that works. But you are not going with off the shelf filters like you see, uh, you see some kind of filter, you say, oh, I will use a biquad for this. Let me go grab the, uh, SVF filters that I already know, or uh, no, you, you derive everything from scratch? Uh, it depends. I think, you know, for this particular circuit, just doing like a first order high pass filter in whatever form you want to do, you know, an SVF or a bi quad. I mean, I guess it would be a bi quad because it's first order, but, you know, so, some simpler IAR filter, it wouldn't really make much difference. For this one, for whatever reason, I was feeling I was feeling like doing some Laplace stuff. So yeah, actually, actually I can show you uh, I can show you what I did. Uh, yeah, hopefully I, I tried to make this code really easy to read. So hopefully it it makes sense. But if you look at the input buffer, basically what's happening is it's just an IIR filter, and then in this calc coefficients function, you see what's really going on. So you have your resistor values, you have your capacitor value. Uh, you derive, this is the Laplace, the Laplace domain transfer function. Uh, and then I just have a little bilinear transform uh, method that I use to, to get the digital filter coefficients from there. Um, so hopefully that, hopefully that's easy to read. <laughs> well, yeah, it is easy to read because you're hiding the magic on line 26. <laughs> Also, this, I guess this code only runs once or when the sample rate changes, right? So, correct. Yeah. So, yeah, it, so it doesn't really matter anyway because. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't make too much difference because yeah, we call it calc coefficients here, and then I guess if if I wanted the high pass filter frequency to be variable, then you could have a parameter for that, and then you would call it whenever the parameter changes. But this this part of the code is not running very often. Uh, the actual filter code. I don't know if I have the filter code in here, but uh, okay, I don't. Yeah, it's just it's just running the IAR filter stuff internally. Um, but yeah, it's 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 pretty cheap to to implement. Um, and then actually, I guess I have a wave digital filter version of this circuit too. Uh, I don't remember why I chose to do both, <laughs> but yeah, actually, no, I I do remember. I was trying to use this as like an example for for someone to show like, oh, here's the same circuit both ways. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that was kind of the motivation. Yeah. And for people who are watching this and they're like, what are these guys talking about? A great introduction <laughs> for, to analog modeling in general and to these techniques like wave digital filters and a modified nodal analysis and even the neural network stuff, which is very nice for marketing reasons. So all of this, <laughs> uh, uh, Jetting has a, 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 an excellent talk explaining how he modeled three parts of the clone center using three different techniques. Well, in one part, there are even two different techniques. So 
a great comparison and walkthrough of these methods. And that's how I learned a lot when I was getting started, just making sense of the field of physical modeling. So go watch that talk. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. I've, I've heard a few people say they really enjoyed that talk, and I, it makes me really happy. But I, I remember when I was putting it together, I was like, "Oh, is anyone really going to want to hear about this?" Because like some people don't care about analog modeling, and I feel like a lot of the people who care will already know a lot of this stuff. But I, yeah, it, it turns out that there's a lot of people sort of in between that that seem to really enjoy that that talk. So yeah, I'm really glad that I did it now in hindsight. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Taylor, I have the feeling that you were going to say something and I cut you. Oh, no, I wasn't, so... <laughs> uh, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, okay. So we saw the input, input stage in two different ways. Um, but there is something else that is quite interesting to me. And that is not in the input stage. That I don't remember in each, each, which stage it was, actually. But you used the neural network, right? Yes. And yeah, that was that was for the com the combined op amp plus or sorry gain stage plus summing op amp sort of that combined part yeah. of the circuit was was how that worked. Yeah. And the interesting thing to me that actually came up last week when I was talking to Dale is that you trained the neural network using outputs from Spice. So you had a simulation of the clone center on Spice. You ran through some audio samples of some guitar playing, and then you trained the model on the simulation. Correct, yes. Yeah, so one thing that I learned last week when talking to Tail is that in many cases, Spice isn't super accurate if you just drop in the components and don't necessarily model the, the more subtle uh, effects of one component on another, or even things like aliasing is not very well treated by Spice. In fact, it is not taken in consideration at all. So I'm interested in knowing how you worked around these issues and how you worked with Spice to make the model as accurate as possible. Yeah, so I mean, it's a little bit tricky since uh, like, because I didn't have the actual circuit to compare with, uh, it's hard to know how accurate the spice simulation actually was to, you know, uh, an exact uh, version of this circuit. And I remember in particular, I, I'd heard that the guy who made the original Clon Centaur was very particular about the diodes that he used. Uh, and so I used spices uh, like the one N three four model in spice. I don't know how exact that is to the actual diodes that are used in the in the actual pedal, um, but yeah, I think as far as the sort of aliasing things and uh, uh, th things like that, something that I, I tried to pay a lot of attention to is the uh, the time steps that the spice is using and the way that it uses the adaptive time steps. Um, and yeah, this was. Oh, several years ago, so I, I don't remember it all exactly, but uh, yeah, I remember having to tweak the time steps a few times to uh, try to make sure that that I wasn't getting any uh, artifacts, whether aliasing or, or otherwise. Um, and yeah, it was it was kind of tricky then because the data that I got out from Spice was not at like a, a constant sample rate the way that we expect audio data to be. Uh, Basically, whenever there was like a corner in the signal or some kind of change of directions, there would be more time steps uh, because Spice was trying to be more accurate in that part of the signal. Uh, and so then I had to I had to do some like weird things to get like a, a constant audio rate signal back out of that. And then I had to resample uh, to 48 kilohertz because the, at the time I was doing this for a class and the whole point of the class was to do neural networks on embedded devices. And so this was why I was using the, the TNC microcontroller uh, and the audio shield for the TNC runs at 48 kilohertz. So uh, I was like, okay, in the end, what I need is an audio file at 48 kilohertz that is hopefully exactly what the real Klon Centaur circuit would sound like, or, or at least this part of the Klon Centaur circuit would sound like uh, for this signal. Again, it's impossible to know without comparing to the real pedal, but hopefully it was it was it was reasonably close. Yes, people seem to like. I don't know if many people 
try to do a comparison between the plugin and the hardware. Do you know people doing this? <laughs> I haven't seen anyone do it. I hope they don't. I feel like the plugin would not turn out that well again because of all these things like the diodes and, and stuff that's so specific to the original pedal. I, plus... I don't know. In this case in particular, I think there is a bit of mystique around this because, yeah, yeah of course, <laughs> this is an original design and a lot of hearing tests went into the choice of components, but even the original author of the Clone Center is not using the magical diodes anymore. He ran <laughs> out of them. So yeah, he's a, and like then he's now. Yeah. And it, it's so interesting, right? Because at one point we are saying, oh, these diodes are magical. There is a limited supply of them. And then we ran out of them. Oh, look at this. I redesigned the circuit to work around this limitation. Now we are using another diode and it still sounds the same. See, you cannot tell a difference. Listening test, you cannot tell a difference. So where is the magic? I don't know. There is a bit of mystique <laughs> around all of this. Yeah, I, th I think uh, th there's a, a pedal maker who I, I really like. Uh, Josh Scott, I think, or, or John Scott, I forget. He, did, he does uh, JHS pedals. They have, they have a, a bunch of great YouTube videos and things like this. Uh, he, he said something once that I, I thought was really, uh, re really sort of profound. And I think it applies just as well to digital effects as it does to, to analog effects, where he was like, you know, people talk so much about silicon diodes or germanium diodes or, you know, these different types of transistors and things like that. And he's like, really... Like, it's not like one is better than the other or, or, you know, one specific part is better than another specific part. Really, it's that the circuit is designed around this specific part. So it's not that this particular diode in the Klon Centaur necessarily sounds amazing. It's that the circuit is de is designed around these particular diodes so that the whole the whole effect sounds amazing. Uh, and that's something I try to think about a lot when I'm doing digital things as, as well as analog. So... I guess this would apply to like the different techniques you use to model different parts of the circuit. Yeah, exactly. It's it's really important to think kind of holistically. So it's it's not just like, oh, this this way of doing things is the best. It's like, okay, this way of doing things in the context of the whole way of thinking about things or the whole the whole sound that you're trying to go for or whatever. I mean, it's the same. I'm, I'm talking about effects here, but for synthesizers and, and synthesis algorithms, it's a lot of the same things. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's just something in the big picture way. That's something I try to think about. And now that you're doing the build your own distortion plugging, you are bringing several models from other places like Guitar ML, and you're coming up with your own models. And uh, are you using other techniques beyond the ones we talked about? Um. Let's see. So there's yeah. So there's some neural network stuff. Uh, a couple a couple neural nets that I, I had trained, and a couple that Keith from Guitar ML had trained. Uh, there's some wave digital filters that uh, some again some that I did, some that my friend Dirk and uh, another friend of mine Sam had had put together. Um, and then there's some basic nodal analysis like a Laplace domain circuit uh, modeling for for some linear things. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess. Uh, yeah, there, there's a few that are not like analog model. They're just kind of fun digital effects that, that I think sound cool. Um, and then, yeah, I guess the one sort of outlier is the the model that I did for the the big muff circuit. Uh, again, I, I don't have the circuit. Like, I don't I don't have the actual pedal, so I had to sort of listen to some demos online and, and uh, play around with some spice models and things like that. Um, but I yeah, I, I went through a few different approaches with that one. I looked at some uh, modified nodal analysis uh, approaches. I looked at some wave digital filter approaches, and what I ended up going with was kind of a, I don't know exactly what to call it. Uh, <laughs> it's it's like a high it's like a hybrid sort of modified nodal analysis thing, uh, where basically it's kind of looking at the. Yeah, I, I I'd have to go back and look at my notes on it, but it's kind of looking at the feedback loop in the circuit as like one delay free loop and then using a, a sort of a global uh, differential equation solver to try to converge that uh, that loop problem into into one like one value essentially yeah sorry that was a, not a very good explanation but I, yeah, I'd have to I'd have to review it myself to, <laughs> to really know <laughs> for someone who is 
doing a lot of guitar distortion things. Do you play guitar? Yeah, yeah, I have a... <laughs> oh. I have my guitar here. Uh, I, uh, I'm i kind of new to guitar a little bit. Like I, I didn't own a guitar until maybe like seven or eight months ago, but I, I had uh, my friend Norman had lent me his guitar. And so I was playing that for a year or so. <laughs> and then uh, my old roommate, Jason, had a guitar. And so I was playing his guitar for a while. Uh, and yeah, I, I, the guitar as an instrument, I find really fascinating because I, I grew up playing piano where everything is so linear. Uh, and just sort of having this combination of, of linear movement up and down the fretboard and kind of, I guess, like parallel movement uh, as you go up and down the strings, I, I find really fascinating. And it's a hard instrument for me. I'm not, I'm not good at it, but hopefully with practice, I'll, <laughs> I'll get better. <laughs> well, the trick is with the guitar, the electric guitar in particular, if, if you have enough effects, you can get by. <laughs> yeah, that's what I keep thinking. I need to make a plug-in that uh, whatever I play, it just make it, makes it sound like Hendrix or something. <laughs> <laughs> if I could do that, now that's a, a million-dollar idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a sampler. You play a note, and it plays the sample. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, that'd be something. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, so... Coming back to one circuit, not necessarily this one, but yeah. uh, one thing that we were talking about last week is using SPICE to not only simulate the original circuit, but also to play around with the circuit and to modify values and see how it behaves. So changing resistor values, perhaps even changing the topology of the, pl the, of the circuit. Is this something that you do too when you are exploring the circuit to understand how it works? Yeah, yeah, this is something I do, not always, but but sometimes uh, is, is I'll, I'll basically just like attach parameters. And this is one of the things I love about wave digital filters is that it's so easy to control each circuit element individually. Is I'll, I'll try to attach parameters to every single resistor or capacitor and play around with them. Uh, and sometimes it's kind of hard to nail down the range where these parameters are actually useful. Uh, and oftentimes you might wind up with an unstable filter or something. And, you know, that's that's always problematic. Uh, but it, it can be a lot of fun. And then a lot of times I'll, I'll, if I'm working on like a plugin or something, I'll try to leave those parameters in the plugin if they're something I find useful or interesting. Uh, so, for example, in, in BYOD, uh, I had found in, in the wave digital diode models that I use, there's a kind of a way to control the number of diodes. So if you have uh, one diode or two diodes in a row or three or four, you know, however many you, you might want, uh, I had figured out that there's just a, a number to, to set in the diode model that you can, you can do that with. And then what's even cooler is you can do that with, uh, it, it doesn't have to be an integer number. It can be a fraction number. So, uh, yeah, here I can I can show this. Uh, hopefully, where is the? Uh, yeah, here we go. So if uh, like I look in my uh, diode clipper module, there's a parameter for the number of diodes, and so you can go down to like a th like a third of a diode, or up to like three diodes if you want, uh, <laughs> which can be kind of kind of fun to play around with. So yeah, the, I, I definitely like to not necessarily modify the circuit, but give the user more control over parts of the circuit than you might have in, in, a, in a physical device. And I mean, obviously, that's something that I don't think any like pedal maker could ever put into a pedal because, yeah, how could you continuously vary how many diodes you have? I mean, maybe someone's got a way to do it. That'd be really cool. Uh, <laughs> Isn't that just a switch where you have a bunch of diodes in a row and you switch where you are tapping into the chain? Yeah, but then it's a then it's a it's not a continuous control. It's like a stepped control. Yeah, you can dial in have switch. So. Yeah. <laughs> Fair point. I guess you could try to. Uh, well, it's not the same. I was gonna say that you can try to cross fade, but it, it doesn't necessarily sound the same. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of an interesting interesting phenomenon. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I do want to catch up with people with what people are saying here on the chat. 
um, I I am talking to you also. I don't really read the whole conversation in real time, but I will go for things that end in question marks. Um, so question from Bo, are you modeling specific characteristics of the diodes in the distortion stage? Um, yeah, so uh, I guess for, for this, uh, like the diodes here particularly, basically uh, the diode model that I use nowadays has a few parameters that are kind of interesting to look at. Uh, yeah, here we go. So I've, first of all, I've got two different diode models. Uh, it, it has to do with this uh, reference paper that I, I use here. Um, there, yeah, there's a couple different like models that, that you can use. Uh, one is a little bit more computationally expensive. It's mainly the difference. Um, but basically, I've got these parameters here. So one parameter is for the saturation current of the diode. Another is for the uh, thermal voltage, which is usually pretty constant. And then there's this number of diodes parameter, which which I had been talking about earlier. Um, and so, you know, depending on who you talk to, that may not be a, a sophisticated enough model. And so I've been working more recently uh, with uh, my friend Chris, uh, who's a student in Singapore at the moment, uh, and we're trying to develop some some different and, and hopefully better uh, diode models that, that could work for this sort of thing. But yeah, that's still, uh, still a little bit of a work in progress, but we have, uh, we have some examples around as well. Interesting. <laughs> it's funny how you start with the ideal component and it's such a simple <laughs> thing, but then when you start getting into the details, it gets so complicated so fast. Yeah, nothing's ever ideal in the real world, unfortunately. Well, fortunately and unfortunately. It's fortunate because that's where all the interesting stuff comes in. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So I will continue looking at the chat. Okay. Uh, I think this will be a question because it ends on a question mark. So Tyler Darlington, hello. It, uh, they say, ask the question on a previous video, but why don't we, uh, why not see overdrive pedals or plugins that only produce even order harmonics when they are known to be in key and perceived uh, as warmth. I think I answered this. I think it was a question on another stream and I answered that with a sample code of you just do half wave rectification and that adds a bunch of even harmonics. But yeah, uh, I would love to hear what Jetting has to say about this idea of even harmonics. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I think a lot of it is sort of personal preference, what kind of distortion you want on a specific song or, or a specific type of sound. Um, as far as, you know, why, why don't more plugins do it? I don't know. I, I, I don't uh, I don't usually like look at my plugins to, to analyze exactly what they're doing as far as like or when I say my plugins, I don't mean the ones that I develop. I mean, the ones that I, I use from from other developers. Uh, I don't usually look and see exactly like what their harmonic uh, structure is that they're adding to the signal. But I mean, th there's definitely plugins out there that do this. Uh, actually, let me see if I if I have this. Uh, yeah, so this is a, a plugin that I was working on with uh, a couple friends of mine uh, for a paper that they're uh, that they're publishing. Hopefully in October, I think. I, I don't know what the dates are, and I don't know if their paper got accepted to the the conference they had submitted to. Um, but this was mainly meant to be a demo of their uh, of their code, and I think if uh, if I set it up right, uh, yeah, and then maybe we can make this bigger. Uh, yeah. So this is this is mainly even ordered harmonics uh, coming from this particular device that they were modeling. Uh, so I don't know, I, I might uh, try to put this model into BYOD or something, uh, maybe maybe pretty soon. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they're definitely out there. I, I, I'm sure if you know if you look through maybe some of Universal Audio's plugins or uh, Nembrini or, or some of these other developers that do a lot of like guitar device modeling, uh, I'm sure you'll see some, some effects that have even order harmonics. Yeah, I. You said that you don't load your plugins and analyze them. I do that 
so much. I spent so much time loading them and well, looking do, at I the spectral own. analyzer and looking at the curves of the attack and release on compressors. It's almost like yeah, a I hobby. Do, I, I do that with my own plugins because, you know, I, I'm uh, especially for like debugging and stuff, it's, it's useful to make sure that like what I'm getting out is the same as what I had gotten in some simulations or, or things like that. But like, if I look at some of the other plugins that I'm using here, like, uh, oh yeah, like this is a baby audio plugin. Yeah, I've never, I've never looked at what their, well, like what kind of distortion uh, I get from here. Yeah, so let's, I don't know, let's turn down the noise. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I'll try to, let's see. Yeah, there we go. Lots of harmonics. Okay, I think I am in front of the harmonics. Here we are. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I've I've never I've never looked at the harmonics for this plugin before, even though I use it I use it pretty often. Uh, yeah, it looks like it's mostly odd harmonics, but some even ones as well. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. When you're doing the DSP <laughs> part of things, do you use some other environment like Faust or even JS effects for the Reaper people out there? Or do you go straight to from mathematics to C++? Yeah, so uh, this answer has kind of changed for me over the years. So uh, for a while, uh, I was mainly going from, well, I, I guess when I, when I first started, I was trying to do math to C++. And that was very difficult for me at the time uh, <laughs> for, for a lot of reasons. Um, and then... A little bit later, uh, I started writing in Python a lot, and so I would go from math to Python simulation. And in Python, it's it's easy to like plot things and visualize things very easily to to make sure that you're getting what you expect to get from whatever thing you're you're trying to work with. Um, and so for a while, what I would do is I would go like math to Python, and then Python to C plus plus, and that usually that, that worked pretty well. And then uh, sort of in the middle there, I took a break from Python and went into Faust for a little bit. And Faust is, is very cool and it's very powerful, uh, but I couldn't really do any frequency domain stuff in Faust. So that was, I was still doing in Python. And I also, I think I have a little bit of difficulty understanding functional programming in Faust. Uh, I don't think it's a, a fault of the language. Like it's just a functional language. That's how it's designed. I think it's just I have trouble wrapping my head around it for, for some reason. Um, and so what I've kind of been working towards recently is developing C++ utilities and, and tools that allow it, that, that, that make it easier for me to go directly from the math to the C++. So for example, like the, the thing I showed you earlier with the bilinear transform, how that's just its, its own little block of code. Uh, like that, for me, it saves a step because maybe I do some nodal analysis and I, I prototype it in Python. I don't have to prototype the bilinear transform step because I already know that that's going to work when I bring it into C++. Uh, so just like little things like that where I, I try to uh, minimize how much stuff I need to do outside of C++ and, and, and maximize how much stuff I can do in C++. And I think that's been really helpful for me in kind of speeding up development for the last... Uh, I don't know, a year or so that I, I've been trying to really expand that side of things. Part of that is that library for working with dig, uh, wave digital filters, right? Where you use templates to generate the C++. Exactly, yeah. And, and that part is less, I mean, the, the the templated aspect of it actually makes it a little bit slower to, to prototype, but then you get better performance later on. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's similar. Like, I don't need to do any wave digital filter prototyping in Python or in another language, because I, I, I know I can sort of jump into the C++ thing. Although what, one thing that I, I do use sometimes is uh, if I want to prototype some wave digital filter thing, I have this little uh, prototyping tool here where I can kind of just build in some, uh, like build in a little wave digital filter thing and try to, I don't know, make a bunch of, I don't know, a bunch of resistors or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So if I, if I want to do some prototyping before I write the code for it, uh, I'll usually use something like this. Taylor, you are using or experimenting with and playing around with that library, right? Yeah. What what I was doing is um, 
using the templated uh, version on GitHub, just the source code, not actually using the library, but just using that and then uh, transcoding it to JSFX. So, oh, nice, nice. So, <laughs> inlining it manually uh, into yeah. JSFX, yeah. How does the how how's the performance in JSFX? I, ha I haven't used JFX, JSFX very much. Well, the performance is actually pretty good. Nice. Because uh, most of the um, things you write directly um, convert to uh, like the machine language code. So, and most things are inlined anyway. So. Nice, nice. And, well, and it's not as C plus plus, but still, it's about to, I guess C plus plus is about twice as efficient, but that's still pretty good. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's very nice. Yeah, for me, my favorite part of JSFX is not that it's fast, is that it has a fast feedback on on development. So you just yeah. save and it doesn't reload, it doesn't compile. Well, it does all of those things under the hood, but all your variables are maintained and you can just see everything working in real time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the development cycle in C++ is definitely maybe the biggest kind of bottleneck uh, for, for prototyping things and developing things directly in C++. Yeah, are you following the developments in like people are using Rust to do digital signal processing? Some people are trying to come up with their own little languages like, well, there was so and now there is this new project that is still unnamed as far as I know, but are Actually, you looking they, into they these things? For it now. Uh, yeah, so I, I definitely try to pay attention to what's going on and, and, and see kind of what people are using to develop these kinds of things. Um, Rust, I, I, I've played around with Rust a bit. There's a, a really nice framework that's in development called NIH Plug uh, that uh, Robert, uh, I think his name's Robert Vanderhelm, uh, is putting together. That's it, It's still like being built up, but I think it's going to be a really nice kind of way to develop plugins uh, in the future. I guess maybe the biggest roadblock for it right now is that the, the Rust community is still trying to figure out like maybe what is the best UI framework to use in Rust um, for, for making desktop applications and things like that. And so I think that's a bit of a bit of a roadblocker for, for uh, NIH plug, but I, I think it's really cool and I've, I've played around with it a bit. Actually, I can show, I can show you guys a, a plugin from there, uh, hopefully. Yeah, so this is uh, this is one of Robert's plugins that he made in Rust. Uh, it's basically like a clone of uh, the Disperser plugin that Kilo Hearts makes. Uh, but yeah, it's it's really cool. I use it sometimes on on things. Uh, but yeah, so so Rust is is really interesting, and I think you know maybe in five years, if I'm writing all my plugin code in Rust, I would be perfectly fine with that. Uh, that said, I, I don't think it necessarily solves the problem of kind of the development cycle. I, I don't know if compile times in Rust are, are that much better than C++. Uh, uh, at least in my experience, they've been about the same. Um, the yeah, the new the new project that uh, Jul Julian uh, Storer and uh, uh, Cesare is the other guy. Uh, the, they've been working on. Uh, I, actually, they they made a name for it now. It's called C Major. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I guess it's hopefully it's like C plus plus or C sharp. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's. Uh, it, I think it's a lot of really cool ideas. Um, and, and yeah, I'm definitely curious to see kind of where where it goes. Um, but yeah, I think at least for me right now, it's maybe a little bit too early. Maybe I'll experiment with it a little bit uh, at some point, the same way I did with NIH plug. Uh, but yeah, I think for me right now, I'm kind of in wait and see. Uh, mode, you know, maybe it'll be cool, maybe not. Um, but I, I will say something that uh, uh, a friend of mine pointed out recently is that everyone seems to want to make different languages to write DSP code. Uh, like you have Faust, you have Sol, you have uh, C major now, you have uh, uh, at least one or two others that I had seen. And, and I definitely understand that from like a prototyping perspective. But, but he had kind of an interesting perspective where he was like, you know, the hard part of making an audio plugin from a programming perspective is not so much writing the DSP code. Like the hard part of writing the DSP code is, is the math. And when you actually write the code, it doesn't look that much different, whether it's in Faust or, or Sol or C++ or Rust. He's like the hard part of writing a plugin is like writing, 
you know, all of this code that goes around the DSP, like if you have a preset manager, or if you have to manage like samples or things that, that write to the hard disk and things like that, is like if you're writing in Sol or if you're writing in, in Faust, like that doesn't solve the problem for you because you still have to manage that stuff outside of, of whatever DSP language you're using. Um, and so I don't know, I think, I think maybe Rust might have an answer for that because uh, at least presumably from the people I've talked to who, who code in Rust a lot, that type of thing may be a lot easier or at least easier to do in a safe way. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see you know, where, where things might go in the next four or five years. Yeah, I guess Tail's solution for this is nice. You outsource these parts. <laughs> That's yeah, always. I still have to uh, maintain the framework to do all that, of course. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and for people who are interested in using Rust for audio processing and for developing Reaper plugins, we will be talking to. Helgo Boss of Relearn tomorrow, and he will be showing us how he's using Rust to use the Reaper API. He developed his own bindings for that, and how he can even process audio, though that's not the main topic of tomorrow's conversation, but it is possible to process audio using Rust. So people nice. who are interested should watch the stream tomorrow. Right. and. Uh, I think that you brought us an example, right? Because this whole thing of um, doing the mathematics and translating it to code, it seems like magic to me. And you brought a simple example that can walk us through this process, right? Yeah, so um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of developing a wave digital filter model and, and sort of the way that I go about doing it. Um, and I, I had some slides from a, a a talk I gave a while ago for the audio programmer, kind of going through basic wave digital filter uh, kinds of things. And uh, so yeah, maybe maybe we could start with something like this. So this is the sort of the wave digital filter way of thinking about uh, a simple RC uh, low pass filter, right? Where basically Can you move you have... like the whole window a little to? Yeah, yeah, that, perfect. Better. Yeah, because otherwise we, yeah. we are in front of this light. <laughs> Yeah, so basically you have a, a voltage source, you have a resistor, and you have a capacitor, and they're all in series with each other. So this is your, your basic RC low-pass filter. Um, and, and so what I've tried to do uh, with my wave digital filter library is abstract out as much of the math as possible. And so you can think of it just in terms of, okay, I have this resistor, I have this capacitor, I have this voltage source, and they're all connected in series. And that's kind of the whole way you, you, you have to think about it. And everything else is, is, taken, care of, is taken care of for you. Um, so yeah, I have a, I've set up a little uh, audio plugin thing here uh, that I can, try to, uh, I can try to demonstrate for you. So yeah, the way I would do this is I would say, OK, well, I need a, I need a resistor. Uh, so I'll make a resistor, and I'll use floats for everything today. And so this will be R1, and this will be 1,000 ohms. Uh, and then I'll do the same thing with a capacitor. Uh, we'll call it C1, and capacitor will be, uh, I don't know, like a microfarad or something. Oh, uh, Atel, do you remember the values we used last week? Because we are working with, conveniently, the same circuit. <laughs> yeah, I think we had a uh, 10k and 0.1 micro or something. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. I remember the resistance, but not the capacitance. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not really sure. <laughs> Maybe you had a smaller value, but it doesn't really matter, I guess. Yeah, I also have a, a little bit of like frequency to, uh, yeah, like frequency to. Uh, component value code from another one that I can bring in. So yeah, maybe let's make it variable. So we can do uh, uh, set cutoff frequency. And again, if you are watching this and you are like, what are these guys talking about? You can watch our stream from last week when we talked about uh, the, the very basics of modeling. And we went over this exact circuit and we Drew it in Spice. We talked about how it works, why the resistor 
is there, why the capacitor is going to charge and discharge more slowly, so it will be taming the high frequencies. So we talked about everything that is necessary for you to follow what we are doing now. I want to point this out for people who are just joining now. They may be like, what? Yeah, you can you can follow along. It's not too mad. It's a bit of magic, but it's not too much. Yeah. So what I, what I've done here is I've copied over my math that does the basically the cutoff frequency to component value calculation, um, and then I also uh, since the capacitor is a stateful element, you also need to tell it the sample rate. Um, so I'm doing that here, and then. Yeah, so now we're ready to kind of connect these two in series. So I'll make a series connector. Uh, and this is some C++ template code, which I can I can talk about if anyone really cares, but uh, it's, it's not particularly interesting to me at least. Uh, so basically what we're doing is we're making a series adapter that connects our resistor to our capacitor. And then finally, we'll make our voltage source uh, I think that there is one interesting thing to point out about this, and that is in at compilation time, you are wiring the components together. Yes, exactly. So the the drawback of that is that you can't change your circuit topology on the fly, uh, which is possible to do with wave digital filters. But when you compile it this way, it's not possible. Uh, I, I have another sort of mode that you can use where where, where you can do that. Um, and that's how the, the little like prototyping tool that I was showing earlier, that's how that works is, is using the other mode. Um, but yeah, when, when you're compiling everything, uh, when you're when you're compiling the circuit topology into the into the plugin, then you can't change it on the fly. Uh, but you get better performance is the, the trade off. Um, you get better runtime performance, but probably worse compilation times, right? Um, yeah, yeah, a little bit worse compilation time, but it's uh, it's the extra compilation time is barely noticeable, at least for a small uh, circuit model like this. For for a large circuit model, maybe it would be more noticeable. Um, but you know, it's it's always a trade off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so basically, all we have to do here when we have a new sample, we can just say, okay set that as the new input voltage. And then we need to do kind of a, a strange thing here, which may not be uh, immediately obvious, but basically we have it set up right now so that the voltage source is like the root node of our wave digital filter. So we need to pull all of the waves in the wave digital filter down to the root node, do some processing at the root node, and then push all of the waves back. Um, and so the way that I do that is I call VIN incident S1 reflected. And so this captures all of the reflected waves from the series adapter and pushes them to the root node, which is the voltage source. And then you just do the opposite to get the information flowing the other way. Ah. And then finally, you need to uh, tell the tell the system where where is the output of your circuit. Yeah, so, so where case, you would be putting the probe in the circuit. Yeah, so in this case, we'll probe the capacitor maybe. I mean, we don't have to, we could probe anything, but maybe capacitor is the most sense for the low pass filter version. Uh, so yeah, let's, uh, let's make this a frequency parameter. Uh, create frequency. Frequency, and we'll have it go from like 10 hertz to 10k, I guess, uh, and center at 100, maybe. Uh, no. What am I doing wrong? I think that's the name, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, this is uh, taking me a second here. I think this is with a slightly older version of my uh, uh, of my uh, like parameter uh, building uh, code, so it might. Uh... 
hopefully uh, I can get back to this. Okay, I need an extra. Okay, min, max, center, default value. I don't know, I'll do a thousand or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay, there we go. So now all I need to do here is say uh, WDF set cutoff frequency. And I'll give it my parameter. And yeah, now we should be able to run this and see what happens. So yeah, here's our compilation time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, while it's compiling, I have two questions here on the chat that I know the well, answer of, so I'll just go ahead and answer to Nathan Hood. Hello, Nathan. Has anyone ever tried rendering wave files through Spice models? Yes, we did that last week, and you can see how it's done. It's not too hard to. And in our example last week, we just rendered with uh, an oscillator in Spice, so it was just a square wave. But you can also, if you want, load audio into Spice and then process your, for example, your guitar using Spice. But that's not in real time, okay? It is something that you have to load a WAV file into, but it's possible. And another question is if this library is available somewhere. And yes, it is. Go to JTIN's GitHub, it is there. And a question from Siewitz. Hello, Siewitz. The question is, there is one question that is worrying me for some time. How much DSP programmers get paid? Smiley. <laughs> well, if you ask me, not enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, it depends. Uh, and I think a lot of it depends on like where, where you want to go to, to work. Uh, like, for example, uh, DSP programmers who work on telescopes for astrophysics and maybe you don't get paid so much with I know a lot of the sort of government research jobs uh, maybe don't pay as much whereas you know if you go to work for uh, Apple uh, and do audio DSP for for Apple you probably get paid quite a bit uh, so yeah it, it really depends on on who you work for um, right now I, I work for myself so I, I don't get paid very much <laughs> <laughs> but what's the market like are many companies looking for developers? Is there a shortage of developers or is there a shorter shortage of jobs? Um, I think there's plenty of jobs available for DSP engineers in general. Uh, I think there's maybe fewer jobs available. Well, uh, obviously any subset is going to have fewer jobs available, but I think generally like a lot of those jobs are looking for more like sort of general signal processing uh, background, like time frequency analysis and and, and things like that, um, and maybe some acoustics and, and stuff like that. Whereas, you know, analog modeling is very specific to like music technology for the most part. Um, but yeah, like, for example, uh, it, I, I used to work for Tesla doing some car audio stuff there. There was no circuit modeling going on. Uh, even if I wanted to do circuit modeling, it, it wasn't something they were looking for or, or something that they had really any need for. Um, but you know, that's uh, that's kind of just how it is. Like this, this type of work is generally more like music industry specific, at least is what I found uh, so far. Right. Okay. So coming back to the demo. Yeah. So we can see here we've got our we've got our RC. Uh, RC filter, and it seems to be working about right. Uh, yeah, I guess that's, well, 10 hertz uh, minus three. Yeah, so it should, so the cutoff frequency should be, should be our minus three dB point. That looks to be about right. Maybe I can zoom in a little. Yeah, that looks pretty close. Um, so yeah, that's the, the basic idea is that you can just kind of compose these uh, circuit elements together and 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 build up a, a model of your circuit from there um and, and it's kind of nice too because it's reasonably extensible like if, if i wanted to take this and build it into a second order uh second order rc low pass filter i could i could do that as well uh basically i would just need another capacitor and another resistor uh and i'll make this called c2 and then i'll connect it I'll connect it to, ah, sorry about that. 
I'll connect it to the other kind of series connection here in parallel. Uh, so I wish I had a diagram of this, but basically the... <laughs> well, the diagram <laughs> of the circuit is what we did last week. But oh, okay. the diagram in WDF is, well, you have to introduce these extra nodes for series connections and parallel connections. So that is not something that is necessarily immediately apparent, but it is related to how we were writing uh, things on Spice when we were doing the text-based version, not the visual version. Because on the visual, you just drag components on the screen. but when you are doing the text version, you have to name the nodes in between. Those were the numbers we had. So we had like V in, in zero, or, uh, and, and that sort of thing is similar to the series connectors and, and parallel connectors. Yeah, exactly. But so basically what I'm, what I'm trying to show here is that you've got the, the R2, well, I guess it's flipped from how I have the, the names in mind, but you have these two RC that are connected in series. And then this capacitor is in parallel with the series combination of those two. Right? Yeah. So that's why I'm going to make this a, a parallel adapter here. And then I'll put this one in series, uh, this, this resistor in series. Uh, sorry, this should be parallel adapter one. And then this will be series adapter two, and this will connect parallel one with R2. Parallel one and R2. And then, yeah, this will just connect to the voltage source like that. And then, yeah, all I need to do here is change uh, the names of what's going to what, and then add the same logic here for setting these values. Uh, yeah, and that should be it. Oh, I need to also prepare uh, a capacitor too. Whoops. <laughs> okay, let me try that again. <laughs> Very elegant API, by the way. Really like how you have to say so little. Thanks, yeah. The, the one thing that really bugs me is I wish I could get rid of this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the, there's a reason why you can't. And uh, uh, Timur Dumler, who, who's like a C++ expert, explained it to me a little while ago. Um, but I still wish you could. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. Uh, you said that you are not too interested in the template stuff, but why do you have to have this? And why would you like to get rid of it? Well, why well, would you like to get rid of it is pretty evident. It is just boilerplate that you have to... Yeah, and it's just kind of repeated information because you're already giving the information here. Why do you need to give it here also? Uh, <laughs> at least that's that's my argument. Uh, but the, the, the reason why you sort of need it is because it's difficult for the C++ compiler to be able to parse uh, the information that it needs at compile time to construct the memory layouts for the classes uh, without that information. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of unavoidable is what I've been told so far. Uh, but well, I guess what you would like to do is to tap, well, <laughs> I spent seven years, six years around this time on a PhD in programming language theory. So when we start diving into these things, I'm like, all excited. So I guess what you're trying to do is step into the inference engine, the type inference engine, so that you can ask the compiler, can you please infer the type of this parameter and give it to me? And that's what exactly. the compiler is telling you. Yeah, I could probably in theory, but I won't. Yeah. And what's what's really interesting is that if you don't compile this as a member variable, or if you don't if you don't make this a member variable, if you just make it like a stack variable, you can actually do it. Uh, you can actually do it that way. So if I just do auto, uh, I don't know, I'll give it a random name. If I do it like this, then you don't need the, the decal types. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's mainly just because of the, the memory layout information that's needed there. Uh, or, oh, actually I have, a, I have a better way of doing this. I can do make series. that nice. that's that's the easy way uh, yeah but eh, unfortunately you can't do that 
or you, you basically the, the problem is you can't do auto, which is how it in C++ auto is how it infers the type for you. You can't do auto for a member variable. And, and the reason why is, is what Timur had told me about the memory layouts and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, the compiler the would need world. another stage to carry this out, right? It would need to do one pass to find all the member variables, another pass to infer their type uh, and, and to use their, their type, and then it could do the memory layout. Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, we get we get our uh, our WDF out of it, and this is uh, this is what we end up with. So we can uh, uh, kind of just do the same thing, and now it's just a second order filter uh, instead of a first order filter. But yes, it's really nice because you can kind of build up these wave digital filters uh, pretty easily just by sticking the blocks together and and, and attaching them uh, to one another until you've got a as big of a circuit as you could want. <laughs> right. Now, I am interested in peeking under the hood. Can you show us one, perhaps even the simplest component in the library? Because most of the complexity is hidden in these resistors, capacitors, series connectors, parallel connectors. Absolutely. Yeah, so this is the, this is the resistor that we've got here. Uh, and yeah, this is kind of uh, all there is to it is, is what you're seeing like right here. Um, so basically, you construct it with some initial resistance value. Uh, if you can change the resistance value, so uh, that's basically what's happening here. Uh, is if you've got a new resistance value, then you can uh, then you can change that. And then, really, the important stuff is what's happening in these three functions. Yeah, I was looking so, at line thirty-seven, and I was like, yeah, I recognize that. <laughs> Yeah, so, so basically what you get is uh, here you have to calculate the impedance of this wave digital filter element. So if I go back to here, this is our R1. Uh, what we're looking at is R1. And R1 needs to tell the series adapter what is the impedance across this port, right? And so when we call calc impedance, basically the, the series adapter will call this method to try to figure out, hey, what's the what's the impedance across this port? And for the resistor, it's very simple. The impedance is just the value of the resistor. And similarly, the conductance is just one over the resistance. Um, for the capacitor, it's a little bit more complicated. For the capacitor, the impedance depends on the capacitance value and on the sample rate. Uh, and so that's that's kind of an interesting, interesting bit of reasoning behind that. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, that, that's what's going on there, and then incident and reflected are kind of the the actual signal flow functions. This is where the actual audio signal is going through uh, going through these methods. So with incident, we're just taking the incident wave and storing it in this a variable, and then this is a little bit of magic of, of wave digital filters here. Uh, we're returning zero always <laughs> for resistors. So the, the reflected wave, the wave going back into the series adapter, is always going to be zero. So this is a... Uh, Wait, what? This is, <laughs> yeah, so this is, uh, this is where wave digital filters get uh, a little bit magical. Um, and and what's, what's really fascinating about it to me is, is the way that wave digital filters break down information flow. Um, and Basically, what's happening here, and this is this stuff doesn't matter at all for implementation, right? Like you could you could never think about this and implement a wave digital filter just fine and do whatever you want. Uh, but for me, I, I really enjoy kind of this nerdy aspect of it too, where you kind of think about what's going on un underneath. And so what's happening is that when the series adapter asks the resistor for its impedance, right? That impedance is that impedance entirely defines what the resistor does, right? And that's why you don't need to to actually pass any information back from the resistor at at audio time, essentially. Um, and and so basically, since the series adapter knows what that impedance is, it kind of subsumes the actual resistance part of the resistor into the series adapter. 
Interesting. Does that, does that make sense? I don't know if I explained it very well. <laughs> the way I understand it is that um, impedance is something... I, okay, so I know just enough about wave digital filters to be dangerous. But what I'm understanding <laughs> from this is that the, the, the concept of impedance and capacitance for that matter is embedded in how you are treating the nodes. So you don't have to do that in one node. You don't have to be just taking care of handling the impedance as you would, I guess, in many, many other models, probably most other techniques, you would be tracking what is happening to this audio uh, sample coming in, what, ha what happens to that on the way out. And now for this one, and now for that one. So a resistor would be a bunch of multiplications and divisions and blah, blah, blah. But in this case, the concept of impedance is in the structure. It is in the framework, so to speak. So you don't have to implement that in the node. Yeah, exactly. So the, 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 I mean, if you really want to dig into it, it's basically treating, it's basically combining uh, what you would call a lumped system where you have a resistor as a lump and a capacitor as a lump. And it's combining that with sort of a, uh, transmission line way of thinking about things where you have a wave and that wave hits some, hits some junction where it gets scattered. Uh, and so some, some information gets reflected back and some in information gets kind of propagated forward. Uh, and so the, the series adapter is basically that junction where some parts of the incident waves get reflected to get, get reflected back to where they came from and some parts get reflected to other parts of the circuit. Um, and, and essentially what's happening here is that all the resistance of R1 is doing is defining uh, one coefficient of this scattering junction in the series adapter, right? Um, yeah, sorry if that was a bit of a uh, too jargony way of, of answering that question, but but yeah, basically the the resistance, the actual application of the resistance to the signal is subsumed by the series adapter and is subsumed by the scattering junction or the, the scattering matrix that the series adapter is, is implementing. Uh, but what's actually really interesting is that the capacitor kind of does the same thing. So if you look in the capacitor, again, there's there's basically no multiplication. All that's happening is you've got this, this Z member variable and you set it when you have an incident wave and then you return it when you have a reflected wave. And so in, in the digital world, we think of that as a unit delay. So all the capacitor is doing is a one sample delay. Uh, and all the resistor is doing is returning zero. And all, all of the actual, <laughs> all the actual work, as you would think of work, is being done by the series adapter. And that's actually, uh, I think I have a, a slide from Kurt Warner here, uh, if I go up a little bit. Uh, uh, I don't have the right slide. I have the slide where he shows how to do it the wrong way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I wish I wish I had the the other slide as well. But yeah, that's that's basically sort of the the magic of wave digital filters is that all of the all of the work is done by these adapters, and all of the sort of leaf nodes out here are, are just kind of providing guidance to the adapters as far as what they should be doing. Yeah, well, I guess it's also the curse of with, with digital filters because it means that you simply cannot model certain kinds of components, or at least not with the basic theory. You would need to extend the theory with other artifacts to handle other kinds of components. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. So the kind of the the drawbacks of like classical wave digital filter theory, if, if you want to call it that, um, are that you can only have one sort of root node. So uh, the, in, in this case, our input voltage is the root node. And the idea of the root node is that it doesn't have to report its impedance to the adapter that it's, it's looking at. So in this case, our input voltage doesn't really have an impedance, but it doesn't, it doesn't need to tell the series adapter how much impedance it has or, or what the impedance of, of this port is. It can just kind of do its thing. And the reason the reason they can do that is is because it's what we call a, a root node, but 
you can only have one root node. So if you want uh, an ideal voltage source and uh, a diode pair, well, you can't have that because that's two that's two nodes that are what we call unadaptable, which means they can't report the impedance uh, that, that they're they're showing at any given time. Um, and there's some ways that you can get around this that the different people have looked at. Um, but then the other big drawback is that uh, sort of the the way that things are structured in terms of everything being in, in, in a series or a parallel configuration doesn't allow for multi-port elements. So for example, an op amp where you have uh, kind of three three ports, like if you look at uh, the op amp here, there's node five, node six, and node seven that are all connected to the op amp. So how does that fit into a wave digital filter? Uh, Not to mention the voltage sources. Oh, sure. I mean, the, the thing with the voltage sources is that a lot of times they're in series with a resistor anyway. Like it, it, in this input stage here, we have our voltage source. No, I, I was talking resistor. about the the voltage supply. in oh, the, the oh, supply right, yeah. of voltage in the op amp. The, the power supply, yeah. Well, y usually those are included as part of the op amp model. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you may want those as a as an external input as well. That can be kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, so this this is where sort of some of the more recent advancements in wave digital filters come in, uh, and in particular, the work that uh, Kurt Warner has done uh, as part of his PhD uh, research and his PhD work. Uh, he, he really kind of expanded on wave digital filters and expanded on the kinds of things that can be done with them uh, to include op amp circuits. So yeah, these, these days I, I actually use wave digital filters for modeling op amp circuits pretty often, and it, it hasn't been too difficult. Uh, for, for most most cases, there there are some cases where it gets a little strange and, and doesn't work quite as well. But like, uh, for example, in this uh, example repository here, uh, I've got uh, I've got this snare resonator, which is a, a wave digital filter that has a, an op amp. Uh, and in this case, the op amp is part of this big scattering matrix here. Uh, and you can you can provide some constants to define your your op amp model and things like that. Um, so it's it's definitely doable. It's just a little bit of extra work uh, and, and requires sort of a few extra steps when you're putting together the model. Well, that that scattering matrix looks scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's uh, so this is actually a, a little tool that I put together that generates the matrix for you automatically. Um, so you, you you don't have to think about it uh, in terms of like actually, oh, I need to actually derive this matrix because that would be, you know, it's it's not a very fun matrix to look at, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's kind of nice because you can just put together a net list. Uh, yeah, actually, I can try to show this uh, if anyone's curious about it. Um, yeah, basically, you put together a net list of, uh, uh, of your circuit components and the connections. And in this case, the op amp is your multi-port element here. So it's got multiple, it's connected to multiple ports essentially. Um, and then, yeah, you just throw this into, uh, I mean, you can either run the script directly or there's like a, a little online version uh, that, that can run it too. Although it, it sometimes crashes for reasons that I, I don't fully understand. And then I have to restart it manually because yeah, I haven't, I haven't made this like a very formal uh, web app. Uh, it, it's very just kind of a, an informal script that's running on my server at the moment. So yeah, you can you can run it here and try to do things. Uh, I don't know. I feel a little bit nervous about this since the last time I tried to do this. <laughs> let's let's go for it. Who knows? Uh, well, I I think that the fact that you have a. a application for this and a Python script for this disappointing. We, we should have this as templates and we should be doing this at compile time. You know, that's the next step. That, <laughs> that is the next step. And there's actually, uh, someone had posted this. Uh, okay, it's not it's not here. It's uh, So my, my Wave Digital Filter library used to be a part of my bigger juice library. And someone had posted some questions about trying to do this kind of thing at uh, at compile time, um, <laughs> it's it's maybe doable. Uh, it's gonna take it's gonna take a bit of effort, 
I, I don't know if it's necessarily like a compile time. I, I don't know if trying to do it with the C++ compiler is really like a, a, a reasonable way to try to solve this problem. I think maybe a, a better thing to do might be to write some script or something that generates the C++ code for you. Um, I think might be the the way that makes more sense. But, Perhaps C macros yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Sewitz has a question here that I I also have. So for for people who are interested in diving deeper, do you have recommendations on these various topics that we have been talking about? So do you have recommendations of books or talks or uh, courses that people can take on? analog modeling in general, but also in wave digital filters in specific. And for people who just need to get started with modified nodal anal analysis, where should they go? <laughs> yeah, um, I think in general, probably the best starting point for any of this stuff, or at least the starting point that, that I, I had was uh, Julius Smith's books. Um, he, he has these free online books that are very pretty easy to read, very easy to sort of search, and, and there's hyperlinks all over the place, so it's, it's really nice to be able to navigate that way. Um, and yeah, it's really, it's really easy to search for things and, and find things that are useful. Um, so for getting started in general, uh, I think that's probably my favorite resource to point people to. Um, for wave digital filters, uh, if you really want to like go for the historical stuff, there's a paper by Alfred Fettweiss from the 1980s where he lays out everything uh, that was known at the time, at least, about wave digital filters. Uh, but I, I think maybe a, a better modern uh, introduction is, is Kurt Warner's PhD dissertation. Um, the, the, the later chapters get a bit heavy, but the first, the first few chapters, I think, are, are pretty digestible. It takes a little bit of time to sort of get through it. Um, it it's definitely a lot of stuff, but I think it's definitely uh, a, a readable uh, introduction to, to these kinds of things. And it's the kind of thing that you can come back to once a year and pick up something new. Uh, I, that's how I treat it at least. Uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, for like modified nodal analysis, there's a couple of, uh, DAFX papers that are really good. Um, I know, I think like the, the sort of the classic one is, is one that Udo Zolzer wrote, uh, I think with Martin Holters and maybe one other person, uh, I want to say it's from like 2013. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of great papers in, in the DAFX uh, archive. Um, and I, I mean, modified nodal analysis outside of, of DSP is, is a very well-known topic. So if you go to IEEE or even Wikipedia, uh, there's kind of a, a, a good baseline for understanding what it is just in general, and then to understand how to apply it to, to digital signal processing. That's where, you know, you should look for the DAFX articles and stuff like that. Right. Okay. So coming back to the example that we were looking at, are there yeah. other parts that we can dig into? Uh, yeah. I mean, what, what do you want to, what, what do you want to add to the circuit? <laughs> <laughs> So you have you wanna, resistors you wanna, and capacitors, series connectors and parallel connectors, and even op amps uh, and diodes, I suppose. Yeah, there's diodes. There's uh, <clears throat> there's uh, polarity inverters. There's inductors. There's uh, a handful of other things. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if you find yourself having to model some kind of circuit that has one of those unicorn components, you would have to go to the bench and measure. And then you would put those values into the model. Yeah, so that that's something that I, I've been working on recently. Actually, is is sort of how do we how do we improve how, how do we use data to improve a wave digital filter model? Because um, something that I found really frustrating is that uh, there's all this hype these days about modeling circuits with neural networks, and, and I think it's really cool. I think it's great, um, but I think it it makes the most sense. <clears throat> for circuits where you can't, you don't have a way of figuring out what's actually inside the circuit. Like you, you have the device and you can make measurements, but you're not able to take it apart and, and see what's going on under the hood, or, or you're not able to get a schematic or something like that. Um, I think neural nets make a lot of sense for that. But when you actually know the circuit that you're working with, 
I think it's kind of annoying to throw away all of the the useful information that you know about your, your circuit and just use a neural net for all of it. Um, and so something that, that I've been working on recently is coming up with a solution where you can use a wave digital filter in conjunction with some neural networks or, or so, something that's trained on, on data um, to, to improve your circuit model. So this way, uh, you, you can avoid this whole host of problems that come with doing everything in a neural network. Like, what if you have knobs? Uh, do you try to train the neural network to learn what the knobs do? That, that can be difficult. Or uh, what, what if you want to run your neural network at different sample rates? That, that can be problematic for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, and so what I had started working on, uh, and I'm still working on a bit, uh, although I've taken a, a little break from it recently, is developing basically an approach where you develop a wave digital filter model of your circuit. And then uh, uh, we, we had started with diodes. But basically, if you have a circuit with some diodes, you construct the wave digital filter model. You make some measurements on the actual circuit. And then you can train you can train a little neural network to model just the diodes part of your wave digital filter. Uh, and then instead of using the, the ideal diode model that I, I, I'm using in my library, you would swap in your, your neural network model. Um, and so the idea there is that, you know, instead of trying to, you know, trying to tweak the, the parameters of your ideal model or, or whatever uh, to get closer, you could just use something that you've trained on the actual, on the actual device. Um, and, and that's not an easy thing. I mean, there's, there's a lot of difficulties that we ran into along the way of, of developing that process, but it, it does work. Uh, and we're hoping to expand to, you know, things like transistors and, and tubes and, and, you know, larger and more complicated circuit components. Yeah, I think that at this point, when you you can knock on someone's door and say, "Here, these are all the things I have been working on. Now you can get me my PhD because the work is already <laughs> done." Perhaps you want me to write a hundred pages on this. I can do that, but the work is already done. Fascinating oh, stuff, maybe. Jading. Maybe someday. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So. Um, we mentioned many things that you are working on, but is there, any, is there anything else that you would like to uh, talk about that is coming up, things that you are working on and that will be out in the near future? Um, yeah, so uh, I've been working on a new update for the Chow Tape plugin. Uh, I'm hoping it'll be out soon, uh, although I was hoping to have it out at the beginning of June and that didn't work. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, it'll get done when it gets done, but hopefully that'll be very soon. Um, and then, yeah, I'm always working on, on new plugins and new things. And yeah, I've, I've been really excited about the, the clap stuff. So hopefully uh, hopefully there will be some stuff to, to show on that front pretty soon. Awesome. All right. Uh, I will open the floor to other questions from Tail. Well, I don't think I uh, have any yet. All right. Okay. Best. All right. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much for joining us. It has been awesome, and I'm looking forward to in the future having you over again if you can, because you have a thousand more interesting things to talk about by then. <laughs> and yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess collectively, I want to say thank you because on the chat there are many people saying how they love your plugins, and uh, it is a work of part passion and we really appreciate all the time that you put into this all the effort that you put into not making only your plugins but also all the other projects you are involved in it is really fascinating work and you are so knowledgeable and generous with the 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 time and, and knowledge that you put out there so yeah um thank you very much for joining us and oh, no problem. <laughs> any final messages to people in the chat and everyone who is watching? Uh, yeah, just thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I have fun. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And thank you, so everyone who was watching this. So thank you, Martin and Bo and Seawitz and Kaiser and Nathan. Probably a uh, is probably missing some people in there, Mr. Job. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Teo, for uh, joining us on this conversation. It's always great to have you here. And yeah, um, that is 
our show for now. <laughs> All right. Thank you much. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you for watching the stream. You know how great it has been. Or maybe it sucked and I am glad that you stuck with me. And so we'll all will be back together for some more coding or talking or chilling. The next time I'll be streaming.